Hi, seventh and eighth graders. It is Miss Sepulveda here. We are going to be reading the reading assignment in packet number two for activity 1.3. Um, so this is the article campaign against pollution vows to work until last straw. Um, and then at the end of this article, we are going to be completing the argument evaluation form. Which I'll also go through and explain. Um, I'm not going to do the work for you. I'm not going to evaluate the argument for you. Um, but I will explain how to do it because especially if you're in like a read 180 class, this is something that's probably newer to you um, that you haven't seen before. And if it is new to you and if it is really difficult, number one, reach out to your teachers. They're, we're here to help guys. Um, but also, try your best. It's okay. It's okay to get things wrong. It's okay to make mistakes. Just try your best and just do it. Um, that's something I'm noticing with a lot of kids who are reaching out to me. They're like, oh, I don't know where to begin. Oh, oh I just don't know how to do it. And it's like, just try it. I can't really help you unless you give me a starting point. So do your best. Try. You can do it. All right. Anyways, on to the article. Campaign against pollution vows to work until last straw. Source, Washington Post by Daryl Fears, published June 24th, 2017. It started so innocently. A kid ordered a soda in a restaurant. It came with a plastic straw in it. Milo Kress recalled. He glared at the straw for a while. It seemed like such a waste. Not only did Kress yank the plastic from his drink, but he also launched a campaign, Be Straw Free, targeting all straws as needless pollution. He knocked on the doors of restaurants in Burlington, Vermont, where he lived at the time, and asked managers not to offer straws unless patrons asked. He was nine years old. Today, Cress, 15, is one of the faces of a growing movement to eliminate plastic straws. They have been found wedged in the nose of a sea turtle, littering the stomachs of countless dead marine animals and scattered across beaches with tons of other plastics. Why single out pollution as small and slim as a drinking straw? Straws are among the top five plastic items volunteers clean from beaches along with bottles, bags, and cups. Conservationists say, Americans use half a billion straws every day, at least according to an estimate by Be Straw Free, based on information from straw manufacturers. That means straws could wrap around the earth two and a half times. The slightest wind lifts plastic straws from dinner tables, picnic blankets, and trash dumps, depositing them far and wide, including in rivers and oceans, where animals often mistake them for food. And they are ubiquitous. Pause there, ubiquitous is just a big, nice, fancy word that means they're everywhere. They exist or are everywhere, okay? So they are everywhere. Nearly every chain restaurant and coffee shop offers straws. They are in just about every movie theater and sit-down restaurant. Theme parks and corner stores and ice cream shops and school cafeterias freely hand them out. But they're starting to disappear because of the awareness campaign Cress and dozens of conservation groups are waging. Walt Disney World's Animal Kingdom bans them as do the food concession areas of Smithsonian Institution Museums. Keith Christman, a managing director for the plastics markets, at the American Chemistry Council, which promotes plastic manufacturers and fights attempts to ban plastic, said in a National Geographic article two months ago that the group would do the same for attempts to eliminate plastic straws. But a spokeswoman for the council said, we won't be able to offer comment or say whether the, group's, the group backs Christmas claim. The movement was growing slowly, was growing at a slow, steady pace when Crest joined it six years ago, but it exploded after a YouTube video of, sea, of a sea turtle with a straw stuck in its nose went viral in 2015. The cringe-inducing effort to pull the plastic out of a bloody nostril outraged viewers, 11.8 million so far. Cress has launched a website on the issue, partnered with several organizations that support 
and testified against straws in the Vermont legislature. Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper cited Cress's activism in a 2013 proclamation that made July 11 a straw-free day in the state. Manhattan Beach outside Los Angeles banned all di disposable plastics, including straws. Berkeley, California is considering a ban. Restaurants in San Diego, Huntington Beach, California, Ashbury Park, New Jersey, New York, Miami, Brandonton, Florida, London, and British Columbia have pledged to ban straws or withhold them until patrons ask for them. The Plastic Pollution Coalition estimates that 1,800 restaurants, organizations, institutions, and schools worldwide have gotten rid of plastic straws or implemented a straw, serve straws upon request only policy, said Jackie Nunez, founder of a group called The Last Plastic Straw. More than 20 such restaurants near Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, signed up last year to be certified by a coalition of groups as establishments that wouldn't serve straws unless they're requested. Ginger Taylor, a volunteer who cleans trash from the Five Mile Beach, said the campaign is working, at least anecdotally. I have been picking up straws on Monday morning on that same stretch of beach for five years, she said. Four years ago, she picked up 248 straws in about two weeks. The next two years, she collected about 500. But the number fell to 158 after the awareness campaign started last year. Straw Fee founder Diane Laughlin said the turtle video inspired her year-old organization. Her volunteers convinced California's Joshua Tree Music Festival to go straw free in May. They also knock on the doors of Orange County, California homeowners who grow bamboo to ask whether they can harvest a little and make reusable straws from a plant. Like several other groups, Straw Free sells reusable bamboo straws online. Theirs in packs of 10 for $1.50. Zantara Parks and Resorts, a concessions company that partners with the National Park Service to provide food and lodging at Rocky Mountain National Park, the Grand Canyon, and other national parks, offers straws at dispensers but posts flyers asking patrons not to use them. Humans didn't really evolve around straws. It's not like we have to consume fluids with this appendage. What really, what is this? Said Catherine Greener, Vice President of Sustainability for the company. The prevailing notion says flexible straws were invented in the late 19th century by Marvin Stone, a District of Columbia man who did not like how the traditional rye grass straw people used for drinking would disintegrate and leave a gritty residue in his mint juleps. Stone wrapped strips of paper around a pencil, glued the strips together, and test marketed the contraption. And in 1888, the disposable straw was born. According, me, according to the Smithsonian's Lem, Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation. The new paper straw was limited mostly to use in hospitals, which used the innovation to avoid spreading disease. Usage widened during the polio epidemic that began in 1900, as people avoided putting their mouths on others' drinking glasses. Finally, in the 1960s, restaurants offered a new invention, a disposable plastic straw. It's a convenience people seem to use arbitrarily, which means like, at people's discretion. Um, so like individuals make that choice depending on the situation. Millions drink soda with a straw, but hardly any suck beer through one. Hot coffee drinkers gulp directly from a cup, cups, but stick straws in iced coffee. Bar hoppers drink highballs from a glass, but mixed cocktails come with a straw. There are plenty of times when straws just aren't necessary, said Aaron Pastor a restaurant consultant and one of dozens of vendors who sell stainless steel, bamboo, and other reusable straws online. Uh -oh. Couldn't prove it. What do you? Oh, come on, friend. Why are we being grumpy? We'll pause there, because apparently my computer is grumpy and doesn't want to load the next couple pages. So we'll let it refresh and just do its thing. 
God, and that lighting made such a difference when the white page came up and my, you could actually see my face and now you can't. And now it's more white, so you can. Hmm, fascinating. All right, but let's scroll through. Let's see if my computer wants us to keep reading. Here we go, we got it. <clears throat> I've sold thousands of reusable straws, Pastor said, but it's not a booming business. This isn't paying my mortgage. Pastor said, chastening plastic straws users, chastising, excuse me, Pastor said chastising, which means like saying like, how dare you, criticizing them um, in his style. If your goal isn't to preach and come across as I'm better than you, that's best. Just say they're wasteful and they end up in oceans and hey, do you really need one? At the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, Melissa and Brian Sharon said no. The parents visiting from Boston with small children who grabbed at food, at food spread on a table shrugged when told the museum doesn't offer straws. It's fine with me. I don't really miss it, Melissa said. Then Brian added, I look in the drawer in our kitchen every day and say, why do we have so many straws? At Zantara's National Parks concessions, we want people to think about this throwaway society, especially in these beautiful places, Greener said. They can take to the air. It's easy for them to get blown around. The anti-straw message is also getting blown around. Greener was looking for composting tips a few years ago when she came across a profile of Cress, who had partnered with a recycling center in Colorado called EcoCycle. Greener wanted to talk to a kid who by then was powering the anti-straw movement in Colorado where his family had moved. Based on their conversation, Greener decided to promote straw awareness at Zantera's concessions. He, uh, he's obviously a gifted teen. He's probably running for Congress. He was very inspirational and innovative, Greener said. All I wanted to do at his age was get my driver's license. I look at kids like that and it makes me very hopeful. Cress isn't running for office yet. He said he's enjoying a six-year passion that has taken him to Australia, Portugal, Germany, France, Boston, Washington, and many high schools all over to deliver speeches. My favorite part about it has been getting to talk to other kids and listening to their ideas, Cress said. It's really cool, and I think it's really empowering. I certainly feel like I'm listened to and valued in a larger community, and I really appreciate that. All right, so that's the end of the article. But now your output to show that you understand this is to complete this argument analysis template. Um, so it starts out with this about argument section. Um, an argument is valid if its premises, basically like its evidence and the reasons, necessarily lead to its conclusion. That is, if you accept that the premises are all true, if you accept all the evidence is true, you must accept that the conclusion is true. An argument is sound if it is valid and you accept that all its premises are true. A good convincing argument is a sound argument. That is, since you accept all of the premises, all the evidence, all the reasons to be true, you must accept that the conclusion is true because the argument is valid. A bad argument is any other kind of argument, okay? So basically, you're just gonna be looking at the arguments that are made in this article about the plastic straws and you're going to be determining whether the argument and whether the reasoning is sound so that is if it's good if it makes sense if it leads you to believe it or whether it's bad those are the two options okay text and author identify the overall conclusion for the point that the author is trying to make so what was the whole point of this piece being written? Why did the author bother publishing this? What did they want you to get from it? Okay, so that's the main idea of the essay. That goes right here. Identify reasons or evidence presented to support this conclusion. What kinds of reasons or evidence are presented? Are they sound or bad reasoning? Why? Okay, so reason number one. This is where you kind of are outlining what the article did. So you find your conclusion, the main idea, and then you're gonna break apart three reasons that support that main idea. And then not only doing that, but you're gonna evaluate it. So that means you're gonna say, was this reason sound? Was it good? 
or was it bad? Why? And then does the evidence, does that reason, demonstrate causation toward the conclusion or simply a correlation? So real quick, Al, sorry if you heard that ding. Real quick, um, this is in the first page where it goes through what your assignments are um, for this assignment 1.3, and it has the vocabulary for causation and correlation. Causation is an action causing something, meaning it's a direct, this happened, so this happened. Correlation is a mutual relationship or connection between two or more things, okay? So causation is like, this happened, so this happened. Correlation is, eh, they're related, but I don't know if this made this happen, okay? I know it's kind of confusing. Um, again, do your best, try your best, it's okay. All right, so that's what you're doing for the other three reasons. Um, it says, and so on if necessary, so if there are more arguments, my assumption is you can like turn this over or continue working in your um, composition book um, and add more reasons. This paper, this format is also very, very tiny, so I might even suggest like duplicating this in your composition book and giving yourself as much room as possible, or again, creating a Google Doc, doing it on a separate page, whatever makes sense in your brain, whatever works for you and your work habits, okay? And then finally, there are three last things you're supposed to fill out. Is there anything that is purposefully left out of this argument? If so, what? Why do you think it was left out? Evaluate the conclusion based on your evidence presented. You may want to briefly outline the argument here. Does this evidence logically support the conclusion or not? Why? Um, so if you said all of the reasoning was bad, you would say the conclusion like doesn't support the argument. If you said all of the evidence, all of the reasoning was sound, it was good, then you would say like, yeah, it does and explain that. Um, so here you're kind of summarizing in a way. Critique the argument. What are its strengths? What are its flaws? So if you were writing an argumentative essay on plastic straws and whether they are beneficial or not, do you think you would use the same points? Do you think that there is some detail being left out? Um, what did this author do well? And what could this author do differently? What could they change? Because writing can always improve, right? Even if you're a professional author, you can always improve things. And that is it for your argument analysis template. Again, I know my Read 180 kids, like this is not something that we have done in class. This is completely new to you. Just dive in, just try, just make an effort, okay? Make an educated guess. That doesn't mean like make the whole thing up. That means do your best, Do an make an educated guess. Listen to me read through this again, if that helps you. Try to read through it on your own and just get it done. You guys are awesome, you're amazing. You're gonna try your best and you can do it. Um, all right. So that is it for the reading lesson 1.3 of packet number two. And I think that's all the videos I'm gonna be doing for this packet. So good luck, reach out to your teachers if you need help, and I will see you for packet number three. Bye seventh and eighth graders.